So hi, uh, thanks for coming and welcome to this talk about the exciting subject of existential types. But wait, existential types, they are going to be removed from Scala, right? That's what uh, Martin Odersky uh, told us yesterday. And that's right, that when we think about existential types in Scala, we think about this foursome keyword that very few people use, but um, actually existential types are a more general concept that we can model with uh, abstract type members. So actually, this talk is more about abstract type members and um, uh, what they are useful for. So let's start. So first, programming is about writing something that is going to be executed by a computer. And then programming languages are all about providing means of expression, right? So that programmers can express what they want easily and precisely. And the problem is that sometimes uh, things are complex, complex to describe. So one way to manage the complexity is to break down a large problem into simpler sub-problems that can be solved independently. However, in, in practice, these sub-problems are not independent of each other. And also, in practice, we can observe a lot of similarities between different parts of programs, right? So for instance, if, if, I, if I go back to this picture, which has been generated by a program, the actual code that generates this picture is very small because um, it relies on means of abstraction to describe um, some general pattern that can be specialized in some uh, different ways. So, <clears throat> programming languages gives us, give us means of abstraction. Uh, basically, means of abstractions are a way to define something in terms of some other unknown thing, right? And the nice thing about, uh, about that, about yeah, abstractions, is that uh, as programmers, we are often lazy and we want to reuse as much as possible, uh, as, much code, as much code as possible. But uh, if our code is too generic, so that it can be used in a lot of various ways, then it cannot be computationally useful. For instance, this identity method is very generic. You can use it with any data type, but it doesn't do anything useful. Um, so what kind of means of abstraction do we, do we have in Scala? So um, I will present them uh, as a square of abstractions. So we will see how to, we can abstract over values and over types in two different ways, uh, using parameters or abstract members. So let's start with a way to abstract over values as parameters. That's the first cell of the square of abstractions. So here, I define this disk abstraction, and the unknown part is the radius of the disk. And uh, despite this part is unknown, I can still define the area of the disk based on this unknown part, because I have modeled this unknown part as a parameter of the constructor of the class. And then, when I use an instance of the disk, I don't care about its radius, right? And only when I create a disk, I have to fill this unknown value with a concrete value, okay? So here I'm using a parameter. That's the first case of abstraction. Uh, the second case consists in trading this constructor parameter for an abstract method. So instead of having a constructor parameter here, I have here an abstract method radius. 
okay? And then the remaining uh, code is exactly the same. I can define the area in terms of this unknown radius. I can manipulate a disk exactly in the same way as before. And the only difference is just a matter of style. But now, uh, in order to fill this unknown value, uh, I have to create a subclass of disk and to implement the abstract method in this subclass. So this approach um, is more object-oriented in a sense because it uh, relies on uh, inheritance. Here, I'm creating this anonym, anonymous uh, subclass of disk. Okay, so this is the second cell of our square of abstraction, abstract methods. Now let's have a look at, uh, no, I have a small conclusion. So yeah, in general, actually, um, parameters and abstract methods, it's important to, to, to see that there are just two equivalent ways to abstract over values. We can always choose one or the other. So why do we have both in Scala? Well, parameters come more from the functional programming world, and abstract members come more from the object-oriented programming world, because as, uh, as I explained, they rely on inheritance. And because Scala is a language that embraces both worlds, uh, it's normal to have uh, these two means of abstraction, right? Now, let's see uh, how this translates to type. So here is an example of uh, an abstract type modeled as a type parameter. I have this invertible trait that can take an unknown type a as parameter. So the unknown part here is the type A. Oops, here. And then, uh, so what we can see, maybe I can use a mouse. Then here, <coughs> I can say that um, this method takes as parameter uh, a parameter of type invertible of t. So I'm, I'm saying explicitly that I want that the the whole, the, the, the unknown part here must be t. And then uh, when I create an instance of invertible, eventually I have, I have to, to fill this unknown part with a concrete type int, like here when I create this invertible of int instance. Okay? So that's the third cell of the square of abstraction. And now, we are just left with the last cell of the square of abstraction. So we are going to do exactly the, the same thing as we did with uh, constructor parameters replaced with uh, abstract methods. We can do the same with types. So here, my invertible uh, trait doesn't have a, a type parameter, but instead, I moved it into a, an abstract type member, okay? Again, that's just uh, an equivalent way to, to say the same thing. It has some difference, mainly syntactic. Like now, if I want to say that this method here takes as parameter a value of type invertible whose type A is T, I have to write this type refinement here between braces. And the same here, if I want to create an instance of invertible whose type A is int, I use the same uh, type refinement syntax, okay? So, I like this square of abstraction because it's very regular. We can abstract over types and values in uh, similar ways, either with parameters or with abstract methods, abstract members, I'm sorry. But uh, if you look at other programming languages, it turns out that very few programming languages support this means of abstraction. And I think that's unfortunate because uh, I think they are super useful in some, u in some situations. So the, the goal of the talk is, is to uh, give more visibility uh, about these use cases. And also, 
Um, Martin Odowski told us yesterday that Scala influences a lot the design of other programming languages, and so I hope that other programming languages will uh, steal this uh, feature of uh, abstract type members after they will watch uh, the talk. So, uh, in which use cases are abstract type members useful? First, encapsulation. So consider, for instance, this um, Scala interface, Scala trait, for this uh, Unix uh, API for file manipulation. So in case you are not familiar with uh, the Unix API to manipulate files, first, before any file manipulation, you have to open the file, and then, and then you get, as a result, a file descriptor, which is just, actually, an integer, just a number, okay? And then you, you use this number in any subsequent uh, method call that manipulates the file, like read the file or close the file. Okay, so, well, the, the problem here is that um, internally, the Unix API uses an integer, but it's dangerous to, to, to have this internal uh, publicly exposed. Right, because uh, anyone can forge a fake file descriptor like his, uh, like this 42, for instance, number. Okay, so instead, what we want, we want to um, to hide to, to hide the the type of the file descriptor. Right, so we can do that with abstract type members. Uh, so that's how I would encode that in Scala. I have a trait Unix files with a, an abstract type member file, and now the open method returned this file, and the read uh, method takes as parameter a file, and so on, okay? Uh, so now, if I try to use 42 as, um, as a parameter for, for this read method, because maybe I know that internally they are using an integer, uh, then it doesn't compile, right? Because, um, the, the, the type system expects that I supply um, a file instance and not an int instance, okay? So the, the only way, if we, if we look at the types, the only way to get a file instance is to use the open method, okay? I have no other way to do that. And that's exactly what an existential type is, okay? That's a type that's unknown from the use site, basically. So we don't know what this file type is when we use the Unix files abstraction. So we have no other choice than using this method to, to create an instance of file. Maybe you might be wondering why, why is it different from having a, a sealed trait file with a private uh, implementation class well, the, the difference is that if I do that, uh, then in each method that takes a file as parameter, I will have to explicitly cast the, the abstract file uh, uh, trait into its actual implement implementation, right? So um, it means that even for the implementers of the Unix files module, this type will be hidden, actually, okay? What we want to do is just to uh, hide the, the, the file type from the point of view of users, but not from the point of view of the implementers of the Unix files module. So that's what uh, abstract type members uh, give us. That's what I've just said. So just to sum up about the encapsulation use case, abstract type members are an effective way to make uh, a type opaque from the outside. So when do you want to use that? Bah, basically, when you want to hide the actual implementation type of a module. Talking about module, let's uh, expand a bit on the, on the topic. <coughs> so um, let's take again an example. So be prepared, there's going to be some hard code. Um, so, yeah, 
uh, consider the following abstraction, uh, a component for user interface. And a component is something very simple. It uh, given uh, a current state, it returns you a view of this state. Okay? An example of component, for instance, very useful, is a counter. What's the state of a counter? Well, it's just an integer, right? And then the view just uh, returns an HTML fragment showing the value of the counter. Okay, easy. Now, let's try something more complicated. Let's try to abstract over another component. For instance, by defining this container component that wraps another child component. So it takes as parameter the child component that's wrapped. What's the state of the container? It can be the same state as the child component, okay? And then, at some point, the, the view of the container delegates to the child view uh, to, to, to inject it in the right place. Uh, okay, uh, let's try something harder. Let's try to abstract over a list of components with this uh, tab, with, uh, tab component that uh, aggregates several children and just enables one of them at a time. So there is one active tab and the other tabs are inactive. How, how can we model that? Uh, that's going to be a little bit more trickier. So the tabs component takes as parameter a list of children where each, each child is a component and uh, a label, just the name of the tab. And then you, you, note, you notice that uh, here the type of the components is unknown because we might have heterogeneous children components, right? We might have one component, what child, one child component that has a state which is int and another one which, uh, which has another type of state and so on, right? So here we have a list of component of anything. We don't know. And what's the state of the tabs component? Um, <coughs> it's tabs.state. So we pack together the currently active tab, the currently active tab, the component of the currently active tab, and its uh, state also. Okay, we pack them together, and that gives us a current state of the tabs uh, component. Okay, but again, we, we need to use a wildcard here. Let's see how we can implement the view method now. <coughs> so we can first uh, show all the tab names, that's the easy part. And then we take the currently active tab and delegate to its view method. And when we call this view method, we pass it the current child state. Okay? I'm sorry, that's a lot of code. Is it okay for everybody? Okay, but that doesn't compile. Okay? Because that's, <coughs> that's because I'm using uh, wildcard types here. So even though here in my, in my type state, I'm using the same S here and here. When, I, when I'm trying to combine them together, uh, the Scala type system tells me that they, they might be different. They are not the same type. Okay, <laughs> so if you are an advanced uh, Scala user, maybe you know that there is a workaround. <laughs> you, you can define this helper method here that turn the unknown type into a, uh, that refines the unknown, uh, the, the wildcard into a, an A type parameter, and now it compiles, okay? But in my opinion, that's very complicated, and uh, I think the, the, the alternative with uh, abstract type members is simpler. So let's have a look at how we can do with abstract type members. <coughs> so here we just, trade the type parameter for an abstract type member. That's it. Then, what about the counter component? Well, we just fix the, the state type member to be int, and then 
this part doesn't change. What about the container component? <coughs> this one is interesting, very interesting. So now we, we have this abstract val child, which is the contain the wrapped component. And then what's the state of the container? We say that the state of the container is the, the state of the child. And here, I'm using what we call a path dependent type to refer to the actual state of the, the actual child uh, member. Okay, so that's something very important. And then the implementation of view is just the same as before. Okay, now what about the tabs component? So <clears throat> now the tabs component, uh, like, like before, uh, uh, takes as parameter the, the list of children, which are, as previously, a list of label and component. But now we don't need the wildcard type anymore because the, the state type is now encapsulated uh, as a type member. So it doesn't show up here anymore. And what's the, the state of the tabs component? Well, what we want to do is to pack together, as we did previously, the currently selected child component and its state. Okay? But unfortunately, this construction is not yet, maybe, <laughs> not yet supported by uh, Scala. There is an open issue about that, and there is also even a PR, but it hasn't been merged yet. So instead, you have to use a trait instead of a case class. You, you will not have the comfort of the case class, but you can use a, a, a trait with, um, uh, with an abstract val child and then the child state member um, whose type refers to the child member here. Okay, and the last part, the implementation of the view. And now it's straightforward. We just uh, delegate to the currently selected child and pass it its child state. Okay, and, and it compiles. <coughs> so um, just to sum up this section, abstract members, so both abstract methods and abstract type members are useful to encapsulate modules internals. And path dependent types are useful to nest these modules together. And when, when do you want to use this technique? Well, basically, if you see lots of wildcard types in your code, that's a good sign that maybe you should try to uh, model your problem with uh, abstract members instead. instead yeah. And last example, type families. So this one is uh, inspired from uh, an existing library named J Free Chart. Maybe you know, know that library. It's a library for drawing charts, like pie chart or statistics and things like that. And this library has two abstractions, two, a concept of plot, which actually draws something, and a concept of data set, which contains uh, the, the data uh, that's used to, to draw the, the plot. And, um, and then we have different kinds of Plot. We have a class PyPlot that draws a pie chart, and we have a class XYPlot that draws uh, a chart with a Y and X axis. And it turns out that each of these class uses a very specific type of data set. So XYPlot only works with XY data set, which is a subtype of data set, and the PyPlot only works with a pi dataset, which is a subtype of dataset. The way it's modeled in Java looks like that. We have a, uh, an interface or a trait in Scala, uh, plot, and another interface or trait in Scala, dataset. And then <coughs> to implement the speci specialization XY plot, we extend plot, but our actual implementation of data set is an XY data set, but we inherit from the set data set method defined in the plot uh, trait. So here, 
we have to do this uh, typecast in order to uh, uh, to, um, to to cast the data set into what we expect to to have. Uh, yeah. So this um, this problem is not is known as uh, family polymorphism because each one each, each time we want to specialize uh, this class plot, we also want to specialize a data set class. So these two classes form a family of classes, a family of two classes that we want to specialize together. Right? And this is typic typically um, a problem that can be elegantly solved with abstract type members. So with abstract type members, now <coughs> the, there is no trait data set anymore. Instead, it's uh, an abstract type member inside the plot trait. And now, when I specialize the, um, the, the plot into an XY plot, I can also specialize at the same time the data set type. So here, I'm, I'm defining it like that. And, and now, the set data set uh, takes as parameter a data set. But this data set is the data set that we just specialized here. So they are consistent together, and I don't need any more uh, typecast. So just to sum up, type families, um, abstract type members can be refined when we refine a class that defines the, type, the abstract type members. That's useful uh, when we want to consistently, consistently specialize a family of classes. So to sum up about the talk, <coughs> existential types are polymorphic types, but which are hidden from the point of view of the user, but not from the point of view of the implementers, obviously. And we can in encode them in Scala using abstract type members. And they could be useful, especially when we want to encapsulate things and they solve also the family polymorphism problem. So that's it. Do you have any question? <laughs> uh, hi, I'm uh, really curious what's uh, on the last 15 slides. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, that's another use case that's similar to, to, to uh, related to type families. It's about, uh, wait, maybe that's going to take uh, too much time. <laughs> that's um, uh, a way to, to define embedded DSLs uh, using a technique based on church encodings. So, <clears throat> Maybe um, a, um, a common way for programmers to embed a language is to define a data type. So for instance, this exp data type um, can represent a language to talk about arithmetic expressions uh, made of additions and literal numbers. And here, that's a program written with this small language. Okay, so we can we can um, think of this data type as a language, right? So this language only describes something, and then we need to um, evaluate these descriptions, right? So to evaluate this description, one way to do that is to use pattern matching. And uh, so here, that's an example of evaluation. <coughs> Another example, for instance, would be to just pretty print the, the expression, right? But in both cases, the structure of the interpreters is almost the same. And we can abstract over that <coughs> uh, by defining this fold method. So each interpreter basically is a fold over the, the data type that describes our language, okay? So, when I define fold, then I can easily define eval and show just as one-liners. 
Uh, now, let's try uh, an alternative encoding. Instead of having uh, case classes and fold, we will just have a trait with abstract methods. And now you recognize this. Instead of having case classes constructors, I have these abstract methods. They are my constructors. And now that's the way I can use this language. I can write the same program as before, just by calling the, the constructors, which are just these abstract methods. So in that, in that case, what does an interpreter look like? Well, an interpreter is just something that implements the, the exp DSL. And the first thing an, impl in, in, an interpreter does is to fix the type the abstract type members. So for instance, for eval, well, the type of exp is double. And then we just implement the, the, the constructors. And then we can um, um, just use the, the program with different interpreters. Okay, we have the same program and different interpreters. So, <coughs> This alternative way of defining a language is, actually it has a name. The name is finally tagless. And here are some papers about this technique, if you are interested. I like this technique a lot. And so what's the, uh, yeah, <laughs> so far I didn't mention the abstract, uh, I, I didn't uh, yeah, mention a lot why abstract uh, type members are useful for this technique. But uh, this uh, technique, finally tagless, uh, um, has emerged as a solution initially, a solution to the expression problem, because one problem with the very first encoding I showed you at the beginning using a seal trait and case classes is that you cannot um, define new alternative of a, of a sealed trait, right? A sealed trait is sealed, so you cannot extend the language in a different module. But here, with the um, finally tagless encoding, uh, we, we get this very, very interesting property, extensibility. I can define a new module that adds new capabilities to my language. So here I'm, I'm adding the multiplication, for instance. And then I can uh, refine the eval with uh, the mule support. So why are uh, type members useful when you, you use this technique? Because in practice, when you have um, <coughs> uh, a trait that defines lots of uh, concepts, in my example, I just have one type exp, but in practice, you might have several types uh, describing several concepts of your language. So for, for, for instance, if you have a language that uh, talks about uh, HTTP endpoints, you might have a concept of request, a concept of response, a concept of headers, a concept of URL. And each time you want to use the HTTP endpoints trait, you will have to carry these type parameters everywhere, everywhere, okay? So with uh, abstract type members, because they are encapsulated into the trait, you don't have to, to carry them uh, at use site each, each time. And it's, it, it's also very convenient because often these type, these type members have like upper bounds and all of these things show up also in the, in the type parameters, and that's a nightmare. So in, in that case, uh, abstract type members are super convenient to just uh, hide that until the, the, the very last point where we just define the interpreter. Yeah. So that's named finally tagless encoding, and uh, that's an extensible way to define embedded DSLs and that relies a lot on object-oriented programming, like inheritance, like we have seen, I'm using uh, with here, and we are using abstract type members, so 
that's really something that makes uh, object-oriented programming shine, in my opinion, and that's something uh, I miss when I use uh, other programming languages. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Any other question? <laughs> I've got one comment for you over here on the side. So firstly, thanks for giving away my talk tomorrow on church encodings and Fagus final interpreters. If you found that interesting and you want more, come to my talk. <laughs> if you know it all now, don't bother coming. Because, well, it's a little bit more than what you've talked about, but uh, it's basically that. Uh, the question, though, is about the... Um, existential types a bit where we had the component and the child and you um, you could solve that compilation error by reifying um, into a type parameter the sorry into a type variable the type parameter mm -hmm. um, which is something I do fairly often to get around problems with GADT type inference as well do you think that is a Scala compiler bug or do you think that is correct behavior to have to force you to this workaround my opinion is it's a bug, but I'd like to know. Uh, I, I do think that's an issue, yes, in Scala. But uh, maybe the, the, there are uh, complex reasons to, to make this behave like that. I don't, I don't know, uh, actually. I don't know more. Yeah. Right. Thanks. <laughs> maybe I've seen another question. Um, apart from that the children list uh, has a size at runtime, how does the, the solution compare to using uh, uh, shapeless age lists? So um, you could use age lists to uh, store different components, right, uh, with different types. Um, Is there some relation or uh, could you encode it with age lists too? Yeah, the, the difference is that with age list you have to know at compile time exactly what your children are going to be, and uh, sometimes you you don't know, you don't know that at compile time. But in, indeed, instead of having a list of uh, uh, yeah, instead of having a list of string component, we could have an age list uh, where each uh, each uh, element of the age list has its own uh, type of uh, of component type, uh, of it, its own type of state for each uh, element of the of the each list. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Or, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot for your attention.